the uh, agenda for the, the session is just on the slide. So um, we've got Professor Chris Todd, who's going to take us through the um, world guidelines for false prevention and management of older people first. And then we're going to pass over to Jula from Wigan, who's going to take us through um, the medicine and falls um, information. And then finally, we've got um, Dr. Kristen uh, Hollands from Salford University, um, who's going to take us through some work um, across GM on physical activity and long term health conditions. Um, so I will hand over to Chris, if that's OK, um, and he's going to take us through the first presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yes. OK, so I'm going to talk today uh, about the World Guidelines on Fall Prevention, uh, which were published almost exactly a year ago. And they were put together by this large number of, of people as a task force, uh, and I was part of that. And I should say quickly that my uh, work with the task force was funded uh, by NIHR, but NIHR are not responsible for anything I say. Um, so next slide, please. The guidelines were put together by 96 experts around the world, there were 40 countries involved, 36 professional societies or agencies, groups uh, collaborating. So it was big collaboration, has to be said. Steering group, 25 members, 12 working groups. And I sat on three of those. And then um, we did 11 systematic reviews. Next slide. Um, the core here, core elements are overall recommendations that we made. Um, so we'll come to those, there's quite a lot of them, but overall recommendations uh, for management of older people to reduce risk of, of fracture and falls. We looked at assessment and we identified the tools um, to, which are suitable for use as assessments um, of risk. We looked at risk stratification um, so that you can use the actual sorts of tools um, to identify and stratify people at risk. We looked at interventions and what we would recommend as the best evidence-based interventions to reduce falls across the piece. And then we also very much recommend that there's a personalised approach, that we customise our interventions as much as possible to reduce risk for older people based on their individual characteristics. Let's uh, move on. The next slide. Uh, there were 12 working groups, uh, one on gait and balance, one on polypharmacy, one on cardiovascular risk factors, one on interventions, um, exercise-based intervention particularly, I, I was part of that, one on falls in hospitals and nursing homes, one on cognition uh, and falls, one on some specific conditions like Parkinson's disease and other um, high-risk conditions. Uh, one looking at falls and technology, and I sat on that one as well. The working group on falls in developing countries that look at the particular issues for developing countries rather than um, the high um, income countries like the UK. Uh, multifactorial interventions as a group, and then a cross cutting group looking at really older people's um, and other stakeholders' perspectives. So trying to involve um, older people themselves. And then the final group was the fear of falls, or as we know it nowadays, concerns about falling uh, group. And I was on that group as well. So I'm going to rush us through the work of these 12 groups, please. What we did essentially was identify the need for a world consensus on falls prevention. Then we decided we were going to do a series of literature reviews look at the best evidence, grade that evidence, make preliminary recommendations internally, through a Delphi process, refine those recommendations. So we had a revised uh, group of recommendations, which we then put up on the web and asked people to vote as to what they thought of these different recommendations before coming to our final recommendation group. Next slide. The evidence we graded uh, using a slight modification of the grade system, essentially a strength of the recommendation is one or two strong evidence. Number one, we really think this one, there's plenty of evidence for this, should, a kind of must do. Two was weaker or conditional evidence about this, so it looks pretty useful, but we don't completely know. And the actual quality of the evidence, we went through ABC, 
from high to low evidence quality or no evidence at all um, available, in which case we had expert consensus. So we had to go back to some older ways of what do we think is going to be our best bet here based on expert consensus rather than evidence. Next slide. So we looked at the algorithm for identifying risk of falls, and that was updated from what you've seen before um, over the years. I suppose what's important here is that there are two, er two ways into it, opportunistic case finding. We think that's going to be very important. Uh, and then presenting to healthcare, which is the traditional route in. And then I think the other things that are very important here is the identification of low risk. Probably true to say that if we identify people as being at low risk, we just left them to get on with things. We're saying now that the fact that low risk individuals, about a third of them experience full means they're low, but not zero risk. So we really should be offering people that we identify as low risk some kind of interventions. And those interventions are likely best to be exercise based and education based interventions. OK, so then we've got intermediate risk, what we should do for them, tailored, follow, tailored um, interventions. And of course, the high risk group, which need much more work up, comprehensive geriatric assessment, multifactorial, multi domain interventions and closer follow up. And so. I won't go through the algorithm, but you can see how you would use this um, to identify people at different levels of risk. Next slide. We made 54 recommendations, which are illegible and intentionally so, because I didn't want you to spend a lot of time on this. You're going to have to look at the paper or the website to get to know those recommendations um, intimately. But what I tend to do now is really run through some headline um, findings. Falls and injury prevention needs to be addressed at the point of care and needs to be multidisciplinary. We think opportunistic case finding is probably a really good way forward. We also feeling that um, multi-domain, multifactorial interventions need to be offered to the highest risk individuals. Next slide. We're going to run through these really quickly. Engaging older adults themselves is an integral part of preventing falls. So we need to understand their beliefs, their attitudes and priorities if we are to successfully intervene. So it's no use just saying, like, this is what you should do without understanding if people, under if people understand and it fits with their lifestyle or their cognitive and functional abilities. Next slide. I've said this already, low risk does not mean no risk. So these falls are not benign. 60% uh, have injuries associated with them. So the low risk group is not to be thought of, okay, we don't have to worry about them. So exercise and, inter and education on falls prevention really needs to be offered, probably at a public health level, it seems to me. Next slide. These multifactorial or multi-domain interventions um, are really quite complex, but how are shown to be effective in reducing the rate of falls if they are followed and delivered to um, fidelity to the programs. So there is a real issue there about the implementation of some of these programs. So interventions, exercise, home hazard prevent, uh, modifications and medication review, and we'll hear a bit more about it, do work, but we really must make sure they're done properly. I'll move to the next slide for the brevity. There are many risks of falls and managing, sorry, many of the risk factors for falls like gait and balance has wider benefits beyond falls prevention alone. It can improve intrinsic capacities, physical and mental health function and quality of life. So we've been look, looking for years at things like exercise and focusing on their fall prevention. But let's think a bit more about the other benefits people get from taking part in these interventions. Not forget those when we're trying to help people um, to take part in our interventions. Next slide. Hospital and home care settings, basically we should consider all older adults in those settings as being at high risk and they will benefit from multifactorial risk assessment and tailored multifactorial multi-domain interventions. It's kind of a bit of a no-brainer we're saying they are at high risk so let's 
not do anything other than say, right, let's do something about these virus uh, situations. Next slide. Vitamin D supplementation comes up as one of those things that looks relatively straightforward, but it should be reserved for those who are at risk of vitamin D deficiency. That's where it works rather than and, and giving the right sorts of levels of vitamin D um, does seem to work. So follow the guidelines. I, I leave this one in because I think there are potentially real risks uh, in our population in Greater Manchester amongst vitamin D deficiencies, especially now that we're hitting the, the, the winter, autumn and winter months. Next one, please. Concerns or fear about falling. There are some strong recommendations to be made about for fear of falling, concerns about falling. That we should and can evaluate these concerns as part of our multifactorial risk assessments. And then we made a strong recommendation for using the FESI, the Falls Efficacy Scale International, free of charge, developed in Manchester. And the short FESI, free of charge, developed in Manchester, um, amongst community dwelling older adults. And that short FESI, seven items, is really the one I would plump for suggesting people use. Next one, please. Nearly there. We should assess um, for falls history and risk before uh, prescribing potentially risk increasing drugs. I think the next speaker may touch on this, so I won't say any more, but we really need to think about there's a whole raft of medications uh, which actually increase the risk of falls. And we need to think very carefully about their prescription, but also, of course, recognizing that they are prescribed for a purpose and those, there's sometimes conflicting aims, um, conflicting outcomes. Next slide, please. Now then, hardly need to be said, but it's important to remember that some of these recommendations will need to be modified um, to meet the needs of older people in the low and middle income countries. Um, so some of the challenges that our colleagues across the world are facing are quite different to the challenges uh, we face in this country and in Greater Manchester. Uh, so we will need to think about those things and how we prioritise risk um, assessment and interventions in low middle income countries. Next slide. So what do we think about the, re the recommendations overall? Well, there's some limitations. Although we had a worldwide representation, Africa was really underrepresented in the membership of the, um, the group. The, Older people with lived experience was mostly composed of English speaking older adults residing in high income countries, uh, North America and UK and Australia. Our recommendations and the algorithm are aimed to be practical and, and deemed to be, we think, hopefully easy to use and apply um, for older people's needs in different scenarios. But we haven't formally tested this yet. And so validation really does need to be performed um, overall. Next one, we've tried to address areas where there's knowledge gaps still there, um, including technology, where technology, there are real knowledge gaps and where the evidence is sparse. And we try to address that by using expert um, consensus. And there's many, many areas for future research. Wearables, how can we use wearable technologies? Um, to, to help reduce falls. What is the roles of dual task gate tests in prediction and stratification of risk, for example? And I think this big one here, implementation. We might well have a lot of recommendations of knowledge and evidence about falls prevention, but it's getting that implemented in real world, in the real world, uh, that is the challenge. And I hope, believe that the work we do as a group in Manchester is so much aimed at ensuring that work research becomes of practical use. Last slide. Thanks very much for listening. Huge amount of information. It's all available in the special issue, and not special issue, in the world guidelines, worldfallsguidelines.com website, and last year's um, paper in Age and Aging. And Beth's going to pop the uh, link to that paper into the chat. Thanks very much. And um, I haven't quite used all my time, but quite a lot of it.
Brilliant. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, I'm going to open it up to any comments, questions, um, observations that anyone's got um, in relation to the presentation. So do just raise your hand and we can bring you in. Trish, would you like to come in? Just where you said Africa hasn't participated much. Is there much effort to get them involved a bit more or? We would love to get them involved a bit more. Um, the problems for the African, the African continent are tremendous in health mm. healthcare. And probably the most participating part of Africa is South Africa. But other parts of Africa, we've had real problems. Thank you. We would love to get more, more engagement. Dula has a hand. I, I have a quick question, Chris, about um, uh, polypharmacy. So we've obviously, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> we, 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 we've obviously known for quite um, a while, really, with regards to the, you know, FRIDs and and um, reviewing inappropriate polypharmacy in patients who are risk at falls. I wonder if you can give me a view on um, what the barriers are and, and any kind of suggestions in in terms of um, literature about overcoming those barriers from the uh, colleagues who are involved um, in meds reviews? Well, it's not my immediate area, but I can point you towards some of it. And I think of some of the work that was done by John Campbell in New Zealand years ago, um, where they reduced one of the first papers that showed about, you know, um, in primary care, review of medications, re removing some of those fall related um, medications and then six months after the trial had stopped looking back and finding every, nearly all the medications have been returned all the people were back on the old medications because the GPs found it more easy to give antidepressant rather than some other intervention to reduce the coming to see them uh, in the practice so there are huge barriers um, that's why I said we've got to remember why the medications are prescribed in the first place. And I would have thought you're the expert in this, not me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, I think, Sue, have you got your hand up? Would you like to come in? Oh, hi there, Chris. Um, thanks very much for the update. Um, I wondered uh, when you mentioned about further research, um, whether AI is something that's being looked into in terms of falls um, and if you've got any studies yeah, happening at well, Manchester. We haven't at the moment really got any studies. We did apply for some money from the European Commission actually to run some work which would have been looking at using an AI that would learn um, as it went, you know, what AI would learn as it went along. Uh, in the prediction of falls and frailty. Um, we didn't get the money and so, but there is that idea is still kicking around and I don't know if Martin Vernon has moved that forward um, in, in the frailty subgroup, uh, not in the clinical frailty group in Greater Manchester. It's definitely on the card as an interesting idea. But to my knowledge, we're not doing it yet. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Sue. Brilliant. If Thank can you. Persuade the, the European Union to, to change their mind about that project. We'd be very happy. To yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> um, any other final co thoughts, comments, reflections for Chris before we move on to our next speaker? No? OK, brilliant. Thanks ever so much, Chris. And, and just to say as well, um, the Greater Manchester Falls Collaborative and the sort of system wide action plan that we've developed does very much um, is very much led by the World Falls guidelines. And we will be making sure that we work with uh, all local areas of Greater Manchester to um, embed um, those recommendations as best as possible. Um, so um, I will very just. Have... <laughs> no worries. Thank you, Chris. Um, let me just reshare my slides. OK, so I'm now going to hand over um, to uh, Dula from um, uh, Wigan uh, and Lee Foundation Trust, who's going to take us through um, and very apt considering the conversation we've just had um, the work around uh, medicine and falls. 
Thanks, Dula. My name is Jewel. I'm the consultant frailty pharmacist. I'm based at Wrightington Wigan in Lee, and I'm really delighted to be here talking about falls and medicines. Um, obviously, it fits nicely in in uh, the discussion that we've just had with Professor Todd. So I'm going to just start. If, if colleagues can possibly just get their phones and the QR codes, and and starting off with a very basic, uh, your own baseline confidence in terms of meds reviews uh, in patients who are at risk of falls. How do the colleagues who are on the call feel at this current present time? And obviously, we're going from the very confident to confident to neither one nor the other, not confident or very not confident. Oh, okay. <laughs> I could possibly have worded that slightly better. I'm not very confident, but okay. <laughs> okay, so brilliant. And this is the kind of conversations that I often have in terms of clinical practice. People have a, you know, a degree of fear and certainly lack of confidence with regards to meds reviews in patients who are at risk of falls. So I think from our current um, six contributors, we've, we're at 50-50 uh, between not confident and um, not very confident. So thank you for uh, for this. So what we're aiming to do, I know it's 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 a high order because we've only got 10 minutes or so with this talk, I discuss how medicines affect falls risk. Um, talk about identification of falls risk increasing drugs. So again, from the world falls guidelines, this is something that we should all be doing as part of our practice. And then understanding the options um, uh, when we're looking after patients who are on FRIDs and who are at risk of falls. Uh, and we, I'm going to have just a quick clinical example to actually talk you through. Uh, so one of the things that we steer away from actually um, using is uh, the label of mechanical fall, uh, because obviously if it was uh, you or me, uh, we wouldn't necessarily fall uh, um, over a loose item on the floor or, or loose carpet. We would either spot the hazard or we would correct our balance to be able to prevent the fall. I think the term mechanical fall implies that fall is benign, which in older people it rare, rarely is. So the idea identification of reasons for the fall having taken place actually forms a critical part of our planning to then address the underlying issues. And again, um, uh, I know it's been referred to, but you know, the multifactorial interventions are absolutely crucial with regards to people who are at high falls risk. So we've done the slide about our baseline assessment. Um, and I think this is pretty much common across all the professions. I teach I teach right across the MDT and, and you know, we often find that, that people do have a degree of lack of confidence in terms of reviewing medication uh, in people who have fallen. So let's just start off very <laughs> at the very basic level of um, what is a fall. So obviously it's a uh, defined as an unintentional or unexpected loss of balance resulting in coming to the rest on the floor, the ground or an object below knee level. So fall itself is a frailty syndrome as defined by British Geriatric Society, as is susceptibility to side effects of medication. So uh, obviously falls and medicines are both frailty syndromes. And um, I've got the clinical frailty scale just on the left hand side, because I, I find that uh, when we are approaching the subject of, of falls, it's quite uh, important to think about the frailty level of our patients with regards to our shared decision making, which will follow once we have a discussion around their medication. So here we are. I know you've seen this already today. So just kind of recapping uh, who our uh, patients are, you know, where do our patients sit? And obviously, uh, I work in secondary care. And, and as Chris has already implied, you know, these patients are high risk across the board. And really, the multifactorial falls risk assessment is very much at the core of what we should be doing and those individualized tailored interventions. So what does a nice multifactorial uh, falls risk assessment look like? Uh, obviously, this is um, our our case presentation. So a gentleman who's had a fall, uh, we should be identifying their falls history. Um, again, uh, this is part and parcel really what, what we should be doing at the point of person being admitted, thinking about their gait, balance and mobility, looking at the functional ability. So within this is the clinical frailty scale assessment and the fear relating to falling. So very usefully, uh, Chris has already alluded to uh, the assessment tools that we have with regards to fear. So thinking about visual cognitive impairment that may be present and neurological exam cardio uh, I've put medication review in bold because obviously this is what I'm talking to you about but think alongside uh, medication review 
incontinence, uh, osteoporosis risk, and uh, obviously patients' home hazards. So the quality statement from NICE, uh, you know, we should be completing a multifactorial risk assessment for patients who are at risk of falls. So in terms of our medication, because we're going to move swiftly on, which of these groups do you consider are associated with the highest risk of falls? So if you just bear with me, sorry, I will go back to my slido and hopefully people can still uh, access the slido. Uh, there we go. So just moving on to our next poll. So do we feel antidepressants, anticholinergic medicines, benzodiazepines and hypnotics, antipsychotics, dopaminergics in Parkinson's disease, or all of the above? All of the below. Yeah, so absolutely. We've got two colleagues who tell me all of the uh, all of the drugs listed here are highest risk of falls, and uh, we've got one person who uh, thinks antidepressants. But it is all of these groups are high risk. Um, so again, we'll we'll just cover that in slightly more detail on the next few slides. Uh, okay. So. Thinking about mechanisms, how do medicines cause falls? So it's usually one or more of the following. We think of sedation as being um, a mechanism by which med medication increase risk of falls, and this is through slowing down the reactions or impairing balance. We've got the hypertension or postural hypertension, um, and then bradycardia, tachycardia, or systole. Uh, obviously, there are many, many more uh, mechanisms as by which drugs uh, cause falls. And I've given you some references again within the uh, pack here um, with regards to you know which papers are actually useful if you are completing uh, medication reviews uh, for people that have fallen. So if we think about sedation, um, the types of uh, meds that you will see uh, in increasing the risk of falls via sed sed sedation pathways of, you know, no surprises, benzodiazepines. So uh, I find myself having conversations about benzodiazepines quite often with my patients uh, about the risks. Um, again, sometimes people have been on these drugs for many, many years. Uh, and it's obviously if, if um, you share a decision uh, outcome is that that the patient was, is happy to consider a review of the medication. Obviously, we need to be tapering those doses very slowly for people who've been on, exposed on uh, to benzodiazepines for many years. Um, Zopiclones, azolpidem, so, so again, your sedative, sleeping drugs, um, tricyclic antidepressants, so anticholinergic medications such as amitriptyline uh, will sedate you and therefore will increase your falls risk. Um, opioids, Sedating antihistamines, sometimes these just sail under the radar because people buy them uh, either at the supermarkets or in the garage and, and, and by assumption people assume that they are safe, but they will obviously uh, increase falls risk uh, because they're sedating drugs. Antipsychotics, which again we've mentioned on the slide, or uh, drugs such as carbamazepine, gabapentin, etc. So um, I, I've got obviously a screenshot of medicines of falls in hospitals, which was the previously produced RCP traffic light uh, summary. Uh, and um, what we've done on behalf of the National Falls Prevention Coordination Group is uh, we've recently produced uh, medicines and falls guide. Again, this is in, in, in the slide pack and it's surmising very much um, you know, the highest risk drugs and what you can actually do as a clinical practitioner if you identify that your patient is on these. Just Referencing anticholinergic bed, and so uh, uh, we have known for uh, quite a number of years that there is a significant risk associated with anticholinergic medication. And, and again, this is just a summary uh, of the actual um, adverse outcomes that, that uh, patients are at risk of with regards to anticholinergic medication. So 60% increase in fall related hospitalization. 50% increased risk of dementia compared to non-use and obviously even mortality risk um, associated with anticholinergic medication. Yet still in, in my clinical practice, and I'm pretty sure that I, this, the same will be the case in yours, we still see these medicines used in our um, frail uh, patients who are at risk of falls. So what can we do about it? Um, this is the um, 
again, traffic light system of identifying medicines which are highest in terms of anticholinergic load. And I'll just draw your attention to the red drugs. So amitriptyline, dosulipine, hyacine hydrobromide, which is your simple quells, which you might get for travel sickness, and oxybutynine are probably the four that I see most often in clinical practice. And then obviously conversations around how much value their patient is actually deriving from the treatment, what is the indication for the treatment, and then um, you know discussion around whether a deprescribing is appropriate or perhaps choosing a safer alternative if the um, original indication is still valid. Again, I've given you a link for the MediCheck where you can check online what each drug actually brings in terms of anticholinergic load here. So if we think about hypotension as another mechanism for causing falls, again, I'm not sure that I'm not, I don't think that anybody will be surprised by the groups of drugs which are associated uh, with hypertension as a pathway. I think um, that the challenges in terms of therapeutic management uh, are there because of limited research, really, and its application to frailty. So I very much uh, approach the hypertension issue as, you know, very much individual to each patient and looking at which medications they are prescribed, which can, which is potentially contributing that towards their hypertension. So obviously alpha blockers are on many do not prescribe lists in frail all the patients. So just being really careful if, if your patients are on that. Um, the other one that I have quite a number of conversations about are nitrates. So as we get frailer, the exertional angina usually does not present as much of an issue because you don't exert yourself because you have got diminished energy reserves as part of your frailty syndromes. And what we find is that nitrates will often contribute towards hypotension, postural hypotension, and therefore falls risk. So those are you know, uh, often uh, targets for deprescribing tricyclic antidepressants pop up again and we've we've mentioned the antidepressants so you know we do see antidepressants as, as causing uh, postural hypotension um, and uh, you know have been identified in various uh, research studies to, to to be you know contributing towards falls risk i think our standard of care for all our patients is a review of lying and standing blood pressure and and obviously in terms of your blood pressure targets. Uh, again, we touch upon this briefly in our document from the National Force Prevention Group, um, actually thinking about the frailty level of your patient when we are looking at blood pressure targets, because those are not well defined in, uh, in literature. And NICE just says that they should be individually tailored uh, to your patient. Thinking about other uh, mechanisms for falls, so obviously bradyarrhythmia bradycardias and arrhythmia. So there's lots of medications which can cause these. Um, Acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, again, sometimes are not recognised, but they are a known cause of bradycardia. And there we are, we've got the tricyclic antidepressants, again, possibly associated with arrhythmias. Other mechanisms, so I could probably give a whole talk about <laughs> mechanisms of medications and how they uh, cause um, falls, but you know, you always never forget your, your glucose levels and your hypoglycemia. Uh, again, I see um, patients who, who are frail and, and are at risk of over treatment from the diabetes perspective. Uh, we've got our anticholinergics again here causing blurred vision as another uh, method of, of uh, false causation and obviously cognitive impairment and confusion which is associated with this group of drugs. So the trick I think sometimes is when is a fall due to medicines and uh, often, as we've said, falls are multifactorials and medicines could be contributing. So we should all be uh, equipped to uh, complete, uh, you know, essential identification of medication, which may be contributing to the falls risk. So when we're thinking about um, is it is it the medicine that's potentially potentially contributing, think about when it was initiated. When did the fall take place? Did, did it coincide with any new medicines? Were there any precipitating factors? And have you identified any of these RIDs as we call them, so high risk medicines on your patient list. If you have, think about the mechanisms which we've just briefly discussed, so sedation, balance, hypotension, and then think about uh, stopping switching uh, or finding a safer alternative or dose reduction as appropriate. So again, the, the method that, that we suggest is the seven steps to appropriate polypharmacy when we are completing medication reviews. So. Going back, uh, just when we think about falls, we must not forget fractures. So, so my last slide oh, is it's just with regards to uh, fracture risk. Uh, so, if I could just quickly uh, ask you as to which of these is not accounted for in the FRAX calculator. So, do you think that it's age, steroid usage, falls, smoking, or previous fracture history that's not accounted for in the FRAX calculator?
so we've got 50-50 split currently, steroids and previous fracture history. Um, interestingly, it's falls. That's not accounted for um, in the FRAX calculator. So when we are looking at our patients who are at risk of fractures, uh, we should be thinking about their falls risk uh, as additional risk factor uh, from our FRAX calculator. So that's worth bearing in mind. And again, from the perspective of the uh, published medicines and falls um, guide, we do give you a list of medication which are also associated with fractures. We mustn't forget, obviously, that our falls patients will be at risk of fractures. I've got a case example. Have I got time, Beth? I just don't want to overrun. Is that OK? So we've got um, a gentleman who's been admitted with a fall and confusion. He normally takes oxybutynin for his bladder, tamsulosin for his BPH amitriptyline for his back pain, amlodipine for hypertension and piritin for hay fever. His clinical frailty score is six and he's 85. I don't know if people want to come in, just unmute themselves and tell me what they would like to review in this patient. Natalie's got a hand up. Do you want to come in, Natalie? I will. I haven't the foggiest, but I'm going to say probably <laughs> the Puritan for the hay fever because you kind of think hay fever is seasonal. And like yep. if it's winter, are you really going to need to take that? So I would kind of get rid of that first, possibly. Sure, absolutely. Anybody else want to come in, say anything about this bed's regimen? I think uh, I would rather think of amitriptyline. Yeah. It's just a back pain that uh, I think it's not, I would say, yeah. maybe to think about if necessary. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I'm going to start with saying we need to review this significant anticholinergic load uh, from, from the high uh, risk medication. She's obviously on oxybutynin, which if we, if we remember our red, amber, green scale scores three, as well as amitriptyline with scores three. So he's really got quite high anticholinergic burden for the level of frailty uh, that this gentleman has. So he's obviously got moderate frailty, but CFS of six. Uh, interestingly, your point about pyritin, very valid, because that also brings in uh, additional score of two from the anticholinergic perspective. And we've talked about sedation. So, you know, just tallying up those three drugs, he's got a quite quite a lot of anticholinergic uh, issues. So it's very much discussion around, you know, what his water waterworks are like at the moment, uh, whether this back pain is still an active issue. I often find in conversations with patients, it's historical and it was obviously started some time ago and it is no longer an active issue, but the drug has been continued nevertheless. And as we've just shown, you know, that there is significant risk of falls, confusion um, and other adverse events with, with these medications with high anticholinergic loads. So it's very much looking that potential of de-prescribing um, de -prescribing them in patients who are at risk of falls. Uh, obviously, we will be checking for postural drops. So we, he's on tamsulosin, which is an alpha blocker. He's on amlodipine, which is a calcium channel blocker, and he's fallen. So we should be checking his lying and standing blood pressure, looking for deficit and looking whether those treatments are obviously still appropriate. Uh, He's also confused. So we've got the fall and confusion. This, the all, all these meds which are anticholinergic will potentially be contributing to his, you know, to confusion level. So we should be screening for causes of confusion, obviously alongside medication, just ruling out anything else. Uh, so if we think about stop fall medication classes, so these are the drugs we should we should be looking to stop in people who are at high risk of falls. Uh, you know, we've got those alpha blockers, as we've said, so tamsulosin. We've got the sedative antihistamines in his case. We've got the overactive bladder meds, which is oxybutynin, and we've got the anticholinergic, so um, amitriptyline, uh, antidepressant. So he, he's got quite a number of drugs which will be increasing his falls risk, so we should be actively reviewing those. So take home messages just to tidy up. Very much individualised approach is required when we are approaching meds reviews in patients who are at risk of falls. Before prescribing any FRIDs, we should 
inquire about falls and consider the risks and benefits of therapy. That is a recommendation from the World Falls Guidelines. And where we are identifying FRIDs, so these high risk drugs, consider if the indication is still present and valid, because this is very much, you know, part of of the essential conversation uh, when, when we are identifying inappropriate polypharmacy, um, consider if safer alternatives are available and then share decision making uh, should be practiced. Uh, that's just a screenshot from our Medicines and Falls guide on the right hand side where further information is available. So thank you very much. I am happy to take any questions and I'm sorry if I've overrun slightly. It's OK, don't worry. Um, have we any quick, immediate questions um, before we move on to the next uh, presentation? But if we do have any, and would it be all right if they were popped in the Post. in the chat and you could answer them directly? That'd yeah. be great. Um, just see if we do have any. Shall I do the same, Beth, and share my screen? So yeah, if you'd so like to, that's absolutely push. fine. No problem. I don't think we do have any, but if there is anything that comes up in the chat, that'd be great if you could follow up on that. Thanks, Julia. I'll hand over to um, Kristen now, who's going to take us through um, the move more integrating physical activity in long term care pathways. Thank you. Um, so hi, everybody. I hope you can hear me OK. I'm tucked away in a corner of a conference center um, at the British Society for um, Lifestyle Medicine, um, where I was speaking this morning as well. Um, so I. I'm going to talk to you about a group of studies that we're doing, um, which are all about integrating physical activity into various long-term care pathways. None of these are false facings as a primary outcome, but obviously all of them will have secondary outcomes on falls. Um, and they're all about, um, as Chris Todd was talking about, getting people to access what we know to be effective physical activity um, interventions that will help both their long-term condition and any, any fall that they might be at risk of. Um, so it's just kind of a point of note that I'm at Salford literally now, but not, you know, in a couple of weeks and I'm en route to Kiel. Um, so I'm sort of on both of those universities. Um, we just see, there we go. So what's the GM context and, and why are we doing this body of work? Um, we all know the evidence for physical activity to help um, manage and prevent long-term conditions. And yet the people who possibly could benefit the most from those conditions are usually the people that are struggling to be as physically active as, as we need them to be to realize their health benefits and their falls prevention benefits. We know that pointing them at gyms and services is not enough. We have to address the wider social determinants of their physical activity behavior. And to do that, we need to be har harnessing the system levers to change those determinants. Um, so that's things like using the research evidence, whole systems collaborations so that we can arrive at place based and person centered solutions. So all of that um, as a strategy is outlined in the GM um, ICP4 plan. Um, and my screen doesn't like to move forward. There we go. So because we're so short on time, I'm going to tell you what the take home messages are um, right from the off. And the, there's three of them. The first thing is that I'd like us all to consider um, to address the reasons that people are not getting to otherwise effective physical activity interventions in the first instance. Yeah. And then the second thing is that it's about an accumulation of marginal gains. Sorry, I know there's people talking right next to me. Um, it's about the accumulation of marginal gains. So this means that if we would like to support people to change their physical activity behaviors, we need to consider what behaviors we need to change in how we support that. So when we're asking other people to change, we have to probably first consider how we can change the services or our role um, in supporting them to do that. And the way that we look at how um, we want to change is to look after yourself first, then others. So put your own oxygen mask on first, then attend to somebody else and start by attending to those people from where they truly are and building them up from there. Which means don't expect them to be able to um, comply with uh, physical activity guidelines right from the off, but you know, might need to support to build them up. So the way that we're doing this across a portfolio of studies is through um, an implementation uh, science underpinned uh, approach and methodology. So we're looking for how academic frameworks like the knowledge to action process can help everybody, all of the parts of the system collaborate together to apply the evidence base that we know exists to practice in order to 
help people to access the physical activity services that we know are going to prevent their fall and manage their other long-term conditions. So there's a range of um, projects that we're doing this with, um, and I'm going to kind of try and pull together um, the really early and uh, broad learning that we've taken from all of these um, because they all sort of speak to the same aim. Um, so that aim is, and this is the beauty of it, is that the shared aim is across all of the stakeholders and across all of these different um, long-term conditions and clinical specialisms, is to understand how can we integrate physical activity within the health and care pathway to support and prevent the self-management of long-term conditions and their falls risk. Um, and how do we make that physical activity and healthy lifestyle support accessible for many more communities across Greater Manchester? So we're doing this in a shared leadership approach. It, that's, in other words, another ter term for it is in a team science approach where it's not academically led, it's not clinically led, it's shared leadership. And in order to um, facilitate that collaboration, we're using the knowledge to action process framework to underpin how we come together. So we use that knowledge to action process to figure out what is the evidence base that needs to be applied for this particular long-term condition or for this particular context. Um, and we work together with all of the stakeholders to take a 360 degree view of what the what the gap, what the no-do gap is um, that's stopping people from accessing the physical activity that they need for this particular condition and context. Then we look to make a menu of solutions to think how can we make that physical activity, um, how can we increase the, the uptake of it, um, and how can we increase the access to it? Um, and then we look to evaluate using outcomes that all the stakeholders have agreed are, um, are representative of meaningful outcomes for them. Um, I know I'm speeding really fast, so I hope everybody's still okay with me. So if I give you examples of exactly what I mean by that, knowledge to action. If the core of a knowledge to action framework is about meshing the knowledge and then underpinning the no-do gap by moving that knowledge into action, then the meshing the knowledge happens using a number of mechanisms and a number of stakeholders. So we're working with a ton of stakeholders, so leisure providers across all 10 local localities of Greater Manchester, Greater Sport, who I think are now called GM Moving, uh, Sport England, a number of NHS trusts and ICBs, the list goes on, all of those stakeholders. Um, and we're working with them using summits and focus groups, one-to-one -one interviews, questionnaires. We're doing overview of reviews, consensus roundtables, and case studies. We're doing, using all of those modalities to try and pull together everybody's knowledge, not just the academic knowledge and not just the clinical knowledge, but the knowledge from across the system. And we're applying that towards the central aim of it didn't want to go and then now it's going everywhere towards the central aim of how can we work better together across the system to use physical activity more to help people manage their long-term conditions and any false consequences of those long-term conditions. So for example, within the uh, interviews that we've done, we looked to find out where physical activity is already embedded in clinical treatment pathways where that has worked, what is the common elements of success and where it has failed, what have been the failures. And we're underpinning that with, again, some implementation um, science uh, frameworks and models. We're also doing things like asking people um, what helps providers to make a referral towards physical activity and what helps the service users to take up that referral and what support do they need to change their referral behavior in order to support people to change their uptake behavior. So we're using things like the behavior change wheel to, um, to underpin things like that. We're also asking within um, uh, case study evaluations, what are the core outcomes that would be meaningful to stakeholders? How do we compare between one context and another meaningfully? Does Is that a randomized control trial or is it not? Is it even possible to do that? Um, and all of that is stakeholder-led design. Uh, so this is, again, part of the team science where it's not academically dictated. Actually, we're working with stakeholders to say, what would the evidence look like that would be usable for you at the end of all of this work? Um, so the three things that we've learned already across all of those stakeholders and all those different modalities of research is put your own oxygen mask on first. Whenever people have described something that's been successful, they've described being supported well themselves before they ever ventured out to do the thing that they did. 
Um, so what relationships across the system do you need to support yourself to use physical activity to better effect or to make those full, you know, the strength and balance classes, uh, you know, more accessible to more people? What support do you need to do that? Um, and then you look to how do you help others with their with with what they need next. So then you look to your colleagues that you need to work with and think, how can you how can your expertise help them? And lastly, when you're helping people, be it your colleagues, other service providers or service users, we need to start by meeting them where they truly are. We need to make movement and physical activity safe, achievable, personal and worthwhile. And by worthwhile, I mean moving more from whatever level of movement you already have is going to be beneficial. You don't have to meet the minimum guidelines straight off the bat. It's like doing a marathon without having any training. So we need to help people to understand how it's safe to work themselves and work themselves up to those guidelines. Um, so, um, look, I've got loads of case studies of these. So we've got diabetes and falls. Um, basically, in one of the localities, we've seen that out of the over a thousand referrals to physical activity services in that locality, um, those referrals were of people with diabetes, yet only one of the referrals came from diabetic specialist healthcare services. The rest of them came from falls service, which means that people with diabetes are falling and they're falling before they get access to physical activity services or they come from primary care the vast majority of them come from self-referral and if you notice across the referral sources the best uptake and maintenance adherence to the physical activity referral is when people refer themselves so hold that thought and if we look at the same kinds of information for physical or for peripheral arterial disease we know the nice guidelines for PAD are that we should be having supervised exercise programming as a front line of treatment. We also know that PAD is linked with increased falls risk and fracture risk. And yet the amount of supervised exercise provision that's available across vascular services in the UK is exceptionally low. And what's even lower is the uptake for people being referred into those services. Yet when only 30% of people actually take up the supervised exercise programming, it's extremely effective. So it works all the time, 30% of the time, in the 30% of people who take it up. So how do we get the rest of the 70% to take this up? So my question starts to be, how can we refer to physical activity and healthy lifestyle support earlier in any diagnosis rather than wait for a fall or another clinical change as the catalyst? And how do we help people to self-refer, not just point at each other's colleagues and say, oh, the next step in your help is over there, but how do you help that person to actually self-refer into physical activity? Because that's what's gonna make them stay. I have no idea what the timing is, but I mean, we could go on and on. The same is true for neuro rehab um, and the, upshot for us is how do we link clinical specialist services with the community provision much more so that you have that holistic referral to physical activity um, in a way that helps people to take it up. And so we're doing lots of different versions of this. And one version within neuro rehab is to use a health improvement practitioner um, to be that link between the, um, the clinical specialism and the the really wide ranging possible options for physical activity that are available for people out in their doorstep. So that that HIPS person is giving you a personalized and place based uh, physical activity um, support. When we've done all of those case studies, we've done a number of things to understand what kinds of support service providers need to be able to give that kind of holistic referral. Um, and there's a ton of kinds of support that people have asked for, but pretty much all of them boil down to having better relationships between the community providers, health providers, and social care providers. Um, and so the good news is it isn't rocket science. It just means that we need to take more time like this to chat to one another, to figure out how we can each help each other. Um, the biggest possible thing is how can we de-risk physical activity? And that goes for service providers and for service users. Everybody's holding on to a bit of a movement is risky for people who have frailty, for people who have um, you know, any kind of long-term condition. And the upshot is it's risky very few on, on very few occasions. And we need to focus on building people up that all movement is good movement. So I'll leave you with that. I have no idea where we're at for time, Beth. Um, we've got a couple of minutes left, um, so I will open it up to uh, any 
comments, questions, observations that people may have um, for including Kristen's presentation, but any of the other presentations um, from the speakers we've had today um, before we wrap up. OK, yeah, so if there are any uh, questions that do come to you and you want to connect with any speakers, do drop me an email on my email address um, that's just on the slide there and I will uh, follow up on that and get back to you directly. Um, but just to say massive thanks to all our speakers, not only today, but um, throughout the week. I think we've had some brilliant content um, and shared some absolutely great um, resources. Um, just to say as well, um, I will be sharing the slides, as I say, probably early next week once we've got the um, edits of the videos up and the transcripts, etc. Um, but yeah, thank you so much and thanks to everyone's attended. Um, and I hope you have a great weekend when it arrives um, and take care. Thank you. <laughs>